All right, so we're here with Mark, CEO over at Ecora, and I think we spoke about three or four months ago now, and uh, quite a bit has happened since then in a short period of time. And I think first and foremost, we should speak about the new acquisition of Fada Borba, the uh, uh, Rare Earths project. So Mark, maybe you can start off with kind of outlining the, the general investment case that the Ecora saw and the opportunity that, that you decided to put essentially $10 million US into. Yeah, well, first and foremost, look, from a really high level, why don't we just start on how it fits into our business and our portfolio? And I think what we've really tried hard to communicate to people over the past few years is we're looking to build a portfolio that provides exposure to first renewable and low carbon energy production, the transmission of that power, and then last consumption and storage of that power. And rare earths fit very tightly within two aspects uh, of that value chain, in particular two rare earth elements, uh, ND and PR. So the Palabora project itself, um, when we screen global uh, rare earth opportunities, consistently comes back as, frankly, uh, amongst or if not the best, uh, highest quality rare earth projects in the world, uh, ex-China. Uh, and that's because actually the Palabora project is not a mine. Um, this project contemplates treating existing stacks of material that have been uh, effectively are, is residue from the production of phosphate fertilizer. So for that reason, you have a much better understood resource that could ever be the case in a mine because the stacks are above ground in a row. Uh, number two, you don't actually have mining activity. In other words, you're not moving waste material uh, above ground, underground, uh, and thus you have lot, much lower operating costs, much lower capital costs because the material is above ground. Uh, as I said, the basket is weighted towards, you know, something rare earth magnets, uh, feedstock material which are absolutely crucial for renewable energy generation, uh, but also electric motors. Um, and most, most interestingly, I think, is that by virtue of reprocessing these stacks, um, it's an exercise in environmental remediation. So for so many reasons, it's a really attractive project uh, that from our perspective, fits really well in our portfolio. So then the next question is, well, what have we actually acquired? Um, the entire transaction deal value was $10 million, of which 8.5 was for a royalty. And in that royalty itself, um, we have certain um, adjustments to the royalty rate. The base case royalty rate is 0.85%. Uh, in the event the project uh, development um, is, is slips, um, the royalty rate has two opportunities to step up. Um, the proceeds of the transaction will be used to fund materially the completion of uh, technical work. Uh, and from there, the project has you know, some final work, but is very close to full production. And we've also included, as part of the deal package, $1.5 million of equity. And you know, this is a relatively small component of the total investment size. Uh, but given the project's qualities and given that we're just at a really low cyclical point for rare earth prices, it, we've, we found it was uh, a great chance to uh, not only benefit from the royalty exposure, but also in a small way to benefit from the significant price potential, uh, uh, price appreciation potential that exists in, in the uh, rainbow rare earth share price. Um, there's some detail here behind the rare earth mag uh, the rare earth market. Um, I think you know the key takeaways on this slide though is that the basket is that's intended to be produced at Palabora is very 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 heavily weighed towards the elements used in permanent magnets. Um, and in today's world, permanent magnets are you know vast majority. Um, you know, something like 90% of the refined feedstock last year anyways, uh, the refined output, excuse me, came from, from one country in China. Um, in that context, you know, the Palabora project is indirectly via a group called TechMet, funded by the US government, the DFC. And again, via TechMet, uh, there's, there's an option or the right for the US government indirectly, TechMet directly, 
to uh, part fund a minority stake to, to fund construction costs. So you know these these minerals are highly strategic, um, and there's a high concentration of these critical minerals uh, in a sovereign supply chain. And in that context, Palabora is exceptionally well aligned with both these long-term demand trends, but also with the um, bifurcation of supply chains that we're starting to see between you know the West and uh, other nations, so to speak. Uh, we've included this is a great slide if someone is keen to better understand the rare earth market. Um, we've you know broken down where these materials go by end market, but also by rare earth element. Um, the vast majority of the growth is expected to be driven by electric vehicles and wind turbines. And so when one looks at a rare earth uh, project uh, or a resource or you know production potential, not everything is the same. Uh, and baskets, in terms of their weighting to different elements, is different. Uh, again, we found, that in our opinion, that the Rainbow Rares Palabora project is very heavily weighted towards the elements that have the most compelling long-term demand drivers. So a quick overview of the project. At the time of the deal, the project had an estimated life of 16 years, although earlier this week it was announced that that life of mine had been extended to 18. First production is targeted in 2027. Um, really high EBITDA margins are expected at 75%, and that's really important, as I mentioned, for projects uh, producing a commodity when there's such a strong concentration of supply. Uh, in other words, it's crucial to be at the very low end of the cost curve. Um, and you can see here, there's a photo of the stacks. So as I mentioned, it's it's not a mining project. It's you know very different to you know. Uh, uh, some of the other rare earth opportunities that we've seen or that are, you know, the prospective producers. So, you know, again, if, if anyone is inclined, there's, there's quite a lot of detail here, uh, but as I mentioned, first of all, the residue material is at surface. It's, you know, chemically cracked. And what that, one of the hardest things about rare earth mining is, is actually separating the elements from one another, given chemically their uh, atomic weight can be so similar. By virtue of just having been processed once to create the phosphate fertilizer material, but also by virtue of you know, the time that has passed since this, these, these, these residues were um, um, created, uh, that's, that's partially liberate, liberated the rare earth elements. And so effectively what that means is it's a relatively lower risk operation to produce the, the, the rare earths as opposed to you know, a greenfield mine that effectively is starting from scratch by mining an ore body. Uh, it's brownfield, right? So you have uh, an existing site where industrial um, activities have taken place. The permitting process is very different to a mine by virtue of it being a brownfield uh, uh, residue operation as opposed to a mine. Um, there's been work done and pilot campaigns are underway. And you know, can't stress this enough, but again, this is a, a great way to, on one hand, uh, extract materials that ultimately uh, are absolutely required to support the energy transition in a uh, very profitable way, while also resulting in a, um, an assisting in addressing what is otherwise uh, an existing environmental um, uncertainty. So for all those reasons, we feel like the investment is really well suited for Ecora at a counter cyclical entry point. And actually, we can maybe touch on that on the next slide, Gorm. You know, when we when when we try to price our uh, commodities, what we're always as a royalty investor, and we, we touched on it when we last spoke. One of the most crucial things that we have to kind of look out for is uh, our entry points and where we price these royalties, because you know if you price them too high, one effectively is predicating an investment case on cyclical prices that maybe are uh, not going to be achievable. So here we feel like if you look at the historical price chart and you think about where prices are today versus three-year lows versus three-year highs, um, you know, from, from, from an core perspective, it's very indicative of how we like to deploy capital. In other words, uh, do fair deals uh, with, our, um, with our partners, but on the flip side, uh, pricing our, our underlying investments such that we're not uh, we don't we're not assuming or we don't require um, 
really heroic price assumption levels. And if that occurs in the future, in other words, if the demand growth results, if the, if the expected demand growth results in, in a, a great price performance, we have a lot of price upside uh, in this royalty. Uh, and that's great because everyone benefits, us, the miner, and our shareholders, most importantly. Okay, so I think um, just to tack on to that, so when you valued this royalty, just to set the stage here, what kind of pricing deck did you use for the commodity basket? Did you use the kind of the existing spot or a bit higher, or what was the the outset there? Obviously, the prices are historically low right now. Yeah, well, whenever we price a royalty, I think we never really price it based on one singular case. Uh, what we've done is we've looked at the implied returns at the three-year lows. We've looked at the implied returns at the three-year highs. And then we looked at a number of iterations between that. And I think you know, the investment case on the three-year lows was still a very healthy IRR in the in the sort of in the range of the uh, mid to high single digits. The um, sort of basis case or the midpoint case is takes you to the sort of double digit level and then the three year highs is well into the 20 plus scenario. So that we on this one, our view is to forecast rare earths is you know difficult. So we wanted to make sure as if we took you know the doomsday scenario, so to speak, where we just ran what we're in today, the three year lows, which are just weak cyclical prices, does this in, number one, is this a good investment for Acora? And can it still be compelling on that basis? Given we have a positive IRR expectation, yes. And then number two, can this operation operate profitably? So such that we're, such that we're off, also getting those cash flows over the life of the mine. And given the cost profile of the underlying operation, the expectation there is yes as well. So, you know, we think it's a very fair deal for us and the miner. Uh, the, um, the, the industry is somewhat constrained as you move forward. Um, and we have really positive underlying demand growth trends here. So for many reasons, we're, you know, we certainly would expect prices over the life in this, over this life of this investment to be subst substantially higher than the three year lows. But even then we're still, if that were to be the case, we still achieve a positive return on invested capital. Um, that's at levels which is maybe not as compelling as we would have hoped, uh, but certainly is um, um, continues to be in a, a good use of capital in our opinion over the period. And what we'll likely see, and you can see it on the price chart in the deck I showed you, you know, rare earth prices have historically shown periods of um, really sharp amplitude in terms of the price acceleration. So in other words, um, we saw rare earth, rare earth prices today around $60 per pound at three year lows. In January 22, a, a basket of rare earths based on the power of a bore basket of material was just around 200. So what we anticipate is over the life of this investment, what we'll see is some, some cyclical performance. We certainly don't anticipate prices will stay at those levels, but that cyclical performance gives us the potential to achieve a very rapid payback uh, just as we move through the cycle. Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting commodity basket that are fraught with risks, but obviously you guys have been able to pick a, a fairly technically, relatively simple compared to many other projects where you don't have a mining operation and the chemical process is, is a lot more, uh, you know, smooth. So that, that's very good to hear. And I think it's an, a very interesting addition to the portfolio. But if I just ask about the the people of the company, can you just comment basically on, on the experience within the current management team at Rainbow and, and why you also decided to, to do an, an equity investment in addition? I mean, obviously you endorse them on that level as well, not just a permanent royalty uh, that you decided yeah. to, to acquire. I, w w at the end of the day, a project and its likelihood of coming into production is a function of the quality of the management team. And the Rainbow management team exemplifies it's a perfect, it exemplifies in many ways and almost always who we like to work with. Uh, these folks have a long track record, uh, the CEO in particular, of bringing projects into production. They know how to build mines, and this is a much simpler operation, but they've done it many, 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 many times in the past, number one. And number two, from a financial perspective, uh, the management team is a very sophisticated um, and therefore, that gives us a lot of confidence that they'll have the ability not just to bring the project into production, 
but also to uh, finance it. And that's not just us. You know, TechMet, uh, we're, we, we've partnered elsewhere with, with TechMet, the financial investor uh, focused on critical minerals. Um, they've obviously chosen to back this management team as well. Again, as has indirectly the U.S. government. So, you know, while we haven't focused on it as one of the reasons we like this project, I suppose, it's really at the top of the list from our perspective. And, and then just uh, to tell everyone, TechMet, I mean, tell us a bit about them and, and what kind of uh, option they have with, with Rainbow in the project. Yeah, TechMet is a UK-based uh, financial investor and they have deployed capital to develop um, projects to supply critical minerals associated with the energy transition. Um, they're uh, the largest shareholder actually at uh, Brazilian Nickel, uh, over which we hold a royalty, but also the right, but not obligation to deploy additional capital to part fund construction. Um, they most recently completed a funding round where they raised um, approximately 150 million from the QIA as part of their wider uh, group of financial investors. Very sophisticated, strong team, and with a uh, strong diligence capabilities, uh, well capitalized, and most importantly, uh, great partners. We think uh, very, very the, the very sensible, pragmatic approach, uh, and very very take, taking a long term view uh, on the development of these operations. Um, in terms of the your other question, in terms of why we thought to took, take 1.5 of equity, you know, frankly. Uh, uh, not just Rainbow, but many companies uh, who provide, who, who are, are developing mining projects in recent and markets have, have, have seen share prices come under pressure. Um, and therefore, the opportunity to acquire the shares at a very discounted price and at asset value that doesn't really reflect the quality of this project, uh, we thought made sense to blend the expected financial returns amongst the royalty, but also the upside potential that exists in the equity. It's certainly not an indication that our strategy has changed. We continue to be focused on royalty investments. However, if there are opportunities like this, where there can be a compelling case to uh, supplement uh, the royalty investment with a small proportion of equity, uh, we'll certainly consider it. But that by no means is an indication that we're looking to change from doing what we do and that we feel we've developed a lot of expertise in, which is royalty and stream investing. Right. And then on to the kind of the financial returns from your guys' point of view. So what's your roadmap to cash flows, kind of the key activities, and when do you expect this to be cash flowing as the baseline in your model? And then approximately with, yeah. you can maybe mention a few pricing, bas you know, pricing <coughs> baskets for the commodity mix here. What kind of cash flows would you guys expect attributable to your royalty or uh, what royalty contribution would you expect for certain price prices of the commodity baskets in the yeah. first few years? Well, the first question then in terms of development and milestones uh, the, in, immediately in front of the company is a completion of a definitive feasibility study. And that's expected to be completed next year. So one to watch out for from there would be a question of finalizing financing arrangements. Um, and depending on the pace of that, assuming uh, a period of time and the production is first targeted in 2027. That could, of course, slip. We certainly hope it's not the case, but it could. And if it does, uh, by a few months, we would see, um, you know, or by a year or two, whatever, what we would see is a step in our role, step up in our royalty entitlement, which doesn't make us better off, but kind of keeps us in the same place in terms of our expected IRR on the investment. So we think that's very fair. You know, if the company delivers on its plan, and so does the company, by the way, right? If they deliver on the plan and the timeline that's expected, they have cost of capital that's as expected and if things are slightly delayed uh, the cost of capital to them and the returns to us are similar to what was uh what we agreed on when we did the transaction so uh, in all parties it's not incremental per se but we think it's fair for everyone involved in the transaction and they agree uh and then in terms of the price i think if you run three year lows somewhere in the range of one and a half to two if you run you know through cycle averages um, it could be in the range of three-ish million, four-ish, and that sort of level. And then if you run the three-year highs, you know, then you're probably upwards of $5 million per year. But I think the likelihood of staying at three-year highs for an, any extended period and for multi-year periods is, is, is 
you know, we shall see if it occurs. But again, it just speaks to, you know, what's something that we really like in the investment and that, you know, what you have is a financial returns case that in our opinion is very sensible, that we think is achievable. But in addition to that, we see a lot of price upside potential just by moving through cycles that, that create circumstances where we feel we could very easily outperform the original investment case. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's that's very good. I think that we should kind of move on to Santa Domingo because obviously the, at the end of the day, this is a ten million dollar investment. It's it's not a huge part of your portfolio. It's 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 good. I like it a lot. But let's speak about the it's about the bigger bigger assets that you guys have. So let's start with Santa Domingo. The feasibility study was released. It was mm. good. So what's your key takeaways? And and uh, at least yeah. let you speak to speak to it generally first. First of all, that feasibility study delivered exactly what we expected. Well, it's an updated feasibility study, I'd say, that just refreshes capital costs, operating costs. So there's a refresh of the mine plan, a reconsideration of, you know, an optimization of the sequencing of the mine plan, and consequently the metallurgical uh, assumptions. Um, and everything came back very positively. You know, we thought the market responded very positively. Uh, it actually improved economics, which is expected because of the synergy potential that we mentioned to you when we last spoke by virtue of this project being in very close proximity to an, to the Manto Verde mine. Um, the project very clearly uh, now established as one of the lowest cost cooperative development projects that's fully permitted anywhere in the world. Over a 17 year mine life it was estimated in the feasibility study that copper cash costs would be you know, just over 30 cents per pound. So even if those are doubled or tripled, frankly, that's a really attractive um, operating cash cost that delivers or should deliver cash flow through commodity price cycles, which as a royalty investor is really important. And number two uh, is a good indication that this asset is much more likely to be built right, than an asset that's at the higher end of the cost curve. Um, so there's a lot to like there for all those reasons. I think in terms of the next steps for the project, Capstone has indicated that they're looking to bring in a financial par partner, which, which is a cookie cutter approach. And that this was the same approach taken to the development of the Manto Verde mine. And then from there, they would look to target a uh, final investment decision previously targeted for 2025, although we'll have to see where Capstone comes out on that. As of today, we've not yet reviewed the long form detailed 43101. Uh, so I think we're really looking forward to seeing all the detail that's come out behind the updated feasibility study, but everything was as expected and in some ways even better. Um, the previous construction timeline would imply sort of a two year build. Uh, that'll have to be confirmed because we've yet to see the detail, uh, but assuming that there were to be a uh, investment decision next year in construction period, you know, we could see some income as early as 27, uh, but we don't think it would be material, but some, um, and then, you know, you'd see more of it coming through in 2028. Uh, and there's a lot to like on this project in terms of its in impact on uh, Acora cash flows, assuming the broker consensus for this asset is somewhere in the range of 30 to $40 million per year, once it's in production at full clip. So the impact and, uh, growth potential, you know, driven from copper. This is a key component of our copper growth pipeline. Yeah, so, so just to crystallize, the broker consensus is that you guys will generate somewhere around, I mean, as you said, 40, 50 million dollars US per year. 30 to 40. 30 to 40. 30 to 40. Yeah, and, as and of, they, as they're of... using which copper price then? Or consensus kind of four, four dollars per pound or is it less 3.5? Yeah, I mean, it's a range, somewhere around four probably. Right. It's safe. But, you know, ultimately, I think when you look at the copper projects today and you look at sort of IRRs, right, what you see is generally an incentive price required to bring on a lot of the next wave supply while in excess of four, right? So if an investor requires a 20 to 30% IRR for the development of a new project, a lot of the copper supply in the world typically is, you know, 420, 430, 440, 450. So we feel that at $4, an asset with this type of returns profile at these costs, at these operating costs is really compelling. Uh, but in addition to that, we continue to see a lot of price upside for copper in excess of, you know, $4 per copper levels. 
and and again, I always like to put into context, and I did, did, did this the last time with Voices Pay, if I recall. But when you're talking thirty to forty million dollars US in cash flows in royalty contribution, although it's a few years out, but still, you, your enterprise value today is around just over two hundred, two thirty, or two forty, or something like that million US, or two fifty million US, I think. Um, yeah, no, like a bit closer to three, probably. Yeah, so so yeah. and 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 you'll see almost a tenth of that, or or you know, I mean. It, it's a really significant. It's enough to value a royalty company in itself because the day, of course, would trade at least ten times uh, operating cash flow or something like this. Uh, or usually, speaking, but the reality is, well, market. today is none of this is priced into our share price, right? No. I mean, the business today, our share price is less than the value of our producing portfolio. So ultimately, you know, there is uncertainty, of course, on any development project. But then the question for an investor to ask himself is, well, what price am I paying for that risk? And at, at a price of zero today, today's share price at a you know just under five percent dividend yield, that's a really compelling growth risk reward. That's a really compelling growth profile, and we would think this, of course, but does offer a really compelling um, uh, capital appreciation growth potential. Yeah, and then if we move on to Voices Bay, that also has done some uh, above expectation speed in ramping up here, which is kind of the same thing, the same kind of uh, profile in terms of contribution to Ecora. In itself, in its own right. So let's just talk briefly about that. But there's a couple of key takeaways here. First and foremost, I think this is an asset that you know, when we acquired the royalty, we, we were, Valet was targeting each, reaching these full production levels around now. So there's no doubt that there's been the slippage in terms of the uh, underground project. And, you know, frankly, it's disappointing. But that being said, the Valet team is excellent. Uh, we continue to be really impressed by what we see when we go to Boise's Bay. Uh, our team actually uh, has, has been at Boise's Bay. We go every year and our team was there uh, visiting, uh, completing a site visit in, in connection with that asset, that asset this week. And helpfully, um, what we see now is we're really at an inflection point for Boise's. And we think that's crucial for this business and its equity case. Uh, so first of all, as you can see on the last left hand side of the slide, there is we've an, a chart showing uh, volume throughput growth, like uh, the ore production bifurcated between the open pit and the underground. And you can see over the next few years an expectation of a very steep increase in the production of material from the underground, which is obviously uh, a contributing factor to the substantial volume growth expectations, but that's also compounded by the fact that the material coming from the underground is a much higher grade of cobalt. So in other words, for every unit that comes from the underground, uh, more cobalt is expected per ton than those units coming from the open pit in the past few years. And between those two factors, that's driving uh, an expectation for an almost 400% growth in the volume deliveries between 2023 and once the asset is expected to be running at full pace by the end of 2026. Uh, and in the, for, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, in the first half of this year, we received four cobalt deliveries. Uh, to date, uh, in basically two months into the second half of this year, we have received one. One is at port expected to be delivered imminently and two are on the water on their way to us. So in other words, we're, we've achieved H1 in the first two months of H2. Uh, and that puts us on very good clip to achieving our H2 guidance of H to 12 deliveries. Next year, some in the range of 20 to 28. And then the steady state production level, as I mentioned, is $40 per pound. Look, if you, if you just extrapolate what this asset can do for us as well, in the first half of this year, this asset generated just under $2 million um, at four deliveries. So, and that's in a very weak cyclical cobalt price environment. So if we just extrapolate that forward and say, okay, four deliveries was just under two, 40 at very weak prices has a potential to do just under 20 for us, right? And again, that's at very weak prices, cyclically speaking. So the asset could do much more. So really we're, we feel, uh, you know, this is an inflection point for the asset and for Ecora. Um, we, we think, this asset will go a very long way towards making towards making the market much more comfortable on our on our revenue profile ex Kestrel, um, 
and it's one to watch. Uh, this asset can do so much more for Ecora, and we're really excited now that it's, it's at a point where that will, where that will be uh, coming through. Yeah, I mean, th this is the kind of the first first asset stepping in and kind of replacing cash flow in, in terms of cash flow profile. And as you say, Ecora has battled with the legacy kind of coal issue, which you have been, you know, working very hard for years now to to get through the replacement. And this is kind of the first, uh, yeah, the vanguard to to step in and do that. So it's it's very exciting to see that it's delivering a bit a bit above expectations. So um, I think that's that's very excellent. So just to clarify for people, next year you would expect it to generate. At current spot prices, sort of ten to fifteen million or something like this, US at current spot prices. Yeah, just just simply extrapolating, right? So in the first yeah. half of the year, we realized on average sixteen dollars per pound, and of course we don't get you know the full sixteen because of the way the stream is structured. But if you just assume at those price levels that it generated just under two in H one, and you could extrapolate that forward, what does it mean at twenty? You just multiply. Uh, you multiply it just under two by five, and then at the higher end of 28, right? So, you no, know, it's an asset that we think will go a long way. And I think, you know, because of the cons because Kestrel has been such an important asset for this company, uh, the fact that the Voices Bay asset just has been slower to ramp up has really magnified concerns about what happens as Kestrel ramps down. So, the more that this asset delivers on its potential, the more we think that that will increasingly offset the concerns around Kestrel. Um, and the fact that this asset has been delayed, we think has resulted in some pressure on the share price amongst other factors. Right. And, and then I think if we pop over to Castro whilst, whilst we're kind of on, on, on the subject. So if we, I mean, it, it delivered above expectations, I guess, here in age one, but you, you would expect age two to drop down to minimal or almost none because they're going to be out of the world of ground. But then you communicate that you expect them to be back in early 25. So what kind of cash flows would you expect to see in H2, if any, and in 25, what's your expectations then with the yeah. withstanding coal price? So maybe you can can speak to what, what the price basket is for those who don't, don't know currently. Yeah, so look, I think on the left-hand side of this page, there's a map, and that should goes a long way, I think, to explaining to investors or interested parties why there's some volatility in terms of our Kestrel royalty. Eric, and what we've done here is we there's a map showing you where our royalty area is, and that's the dark blue shaded area labeled the core royalty area. And that's overlaid on the mine plan. And mining starts at, in these long wall panels, the uh, southwest corner, starting at long wall panel 500, and then moves north sequentially. You know, so in other words, you start at long wall panel 500, and then you move to 501, 502, and so forth. And you can very easily understand why mining in the first half of this year was so heavily weighted to our royalty area, and then why mining in the second half is not expected to be the case, right? And then you can see we've also labeled, uh, based on historical mining rates, which panels are expected to be mined when. And there's a bit of a misconception, I think, on our Kestrel royalty. Uh, in, and I think it's just important to keep in mind that we're not really, this is not a Kestrel cliff where, you know, next after next year, Kestrel goes to zero. It's really much more of a taper. So in the first half of this year, we saw Kestrel volumes in our royalty area of just around 2 million tons. Uh, next year, assuming uh, similar, you know, yields and other mining factors, we'd expect 2 million or more. Uh, the year after that, 1 million or more, and then between 26 to 27, somewhere in the range of, you know, two to 300,000 to 600,000 per tons, all the way up to from 20, from 27, 26, from 2027 to um, 2030. Um, in terms of the price forecast, I think that, you know, the royalty is very sensitive to the metallurgical coal price assumption, and the market has its own views on what met coal price will be realized. So, you know, we're, we, we haven't given guidance on what those volumes mean in terms of royalty income, um, but by virtue of the guidance on the uh, pri on the volumes expected within our, our, our royalty area, uh, it should be very possible and relatively simple to take our view on what contributions will uh, are, are expected. Um, in terms of the current price market environment, 
I think we got very lucky actually. It was really fortuitous that our volumes were way to H1 of the year. Uh, we've seen Met coal prices soften and thus far into H2 uh, with the market expectation that Met coal prices will recover uh, by towards the end of uh, 2024 for 2025. And effectively what that means is we could be you know, in a period where we saw strong cash flow from Kestrel and H1. Uh, H2, we don't really have exposure to what is today a bit of a softer steel making coal price environment. And again, if one looks at broker price forecasts, now there's an expectation that prices should improve uh, going back into 2025 uh, when Kestrel operations are expected to be back in the a core royalty area. So look, we'll see how that plays out on the price side, of course. Uh, there are a lot of factors that will impact where Met coal prices go. Uh, but today we see Met coal prices sort of in the range of $180 per ton to $200 per ton. Uh, and that's actually well into the cost curve of production. So sitting from here, the market isn't really expected to see that much softer price level, levels just by virtue of the fact that, you know, it's unusual to see pricing go much deeper uh, into the cost curve, even in periods of market weakness. And secondly, you know, the supply of metallurgical coal is much more constrained than many other commodities. Um, and therefore, um, that it's just a positive factor supporting the price, we think, relative, for example, iron ore, where there's just a lot more capacity in the world. Yes. And then if we move over to West Moscow, obviously BHP uh, announced they would be kind of suspending operations there or, or not, not pursue the uh, cap further capital investment there for now. And they communicated that they would um, kind of have review and come up with a new uh, continuous plan or, or next steps by early 27. So if you just comment to, to this, just give your general comments about the situation there. Yeah, look, I think, B, I think BHP indicated earlier this year that it was reviewing its Western Australian nickel uh, division in light of nickel price market weakness. Uh, we spoke about that when we last... Um, um, in our last interview, and BHP has since indicated that they'll effectively be putting their Western Australian nickel division, which includes Nickel West, as well as the West Mus Musgrave project, temporarily on hold, and with a view to revisit the decision by February 2027, as you mentioned. Um, BHP is allocating substantial capital to the um, maintenance of these assets, over $300 million a year. So by no means do we, is it our view that BHP has, at this stage anyways, thrown in the towel, so to speak, on its nickel division. Um, I think that the decision to put nickel uh, West Musgrave on hold, you know, is disappointing, obviously, in particular because this asset is just so, it should be so low, operate uh, at really low ends of the industry cost curve. And based on the disclosures previously by Oz Minerals and the technical work that was completed prior to BHP acquiring Oz Minerals, this asset would be expected to be within the lowest operating cost quartile of the nickel industry. So in other words, you know, when we deploy capital, we make royalty investments, we look for royalties over assets that are very defensively positioned on the cost curve and should be able to generate strong cash flows to operate through commodity cycle price cycles, which West Musgrave is as a mine. And in fact, BHP commented earlier this year that the West Musgrave operation, as a, if it were up and running, should still be able to deliver very decent returns, uh, even in really weak nickel price market conditions. And that's in part a function of the asset being uh, so heavily weighed to copper. Because uh, if, if you'll remember, uh, at spot prices, it's somewhere in the range of you know 50 to 60 percent nickel, 40 to 60 percent copper, with the potential actually in the future to do much more on the copper side. And a lot of that has been already disclosed publicly by Oz Minerals. So look, what can we say? It's disappointing. Uh, but for the same reasons that uh, that I just mentioned, we're also really confident in this asset's potential in the longer term. Um, fully permitted in Australia, low cost, nickel exposure with the potential to be uh, much more heavily weighed towards copper. So uh, we remain confident in the asset, a very long mine life, life of mine extension potential, everything to love in a royalty investment. But unfortunately, it looks like in this instance, uh, the first, first production date will be delayed from what was previously communicated as a target date of 26. When we made the investment, 
our expectation that this asset could come into production in 26, but certainly wasn't the foundation of the investment case. Uh, we saw it as 2026 at the earliest, could be later. And so now, you know, from a returns perspective, we're not too far away, frankly, from the original investment case. But, you know, where it's where I think it impacts Ecora is simply in terms of the, co the contribution timeline. In other words, uh, this asset was expected to generate by equity research analysts 10 to 15 million dollars a year, you know, materially kicking off in 2027. And in the context of the Kestrel ramp down, you know, that delay is uh, potentially accentuated. The, the quantum in itself, though, is manageable, we think. You know, right now it's 2024. We have a line of sight on other opportunities. Uh, if we're able to complete one, we think we can, you know, find ways to replace that source of 10 to $15 million a year in 26, 20, you know, targeting loosely um, between now and 2030. Um, but in any event, uh, the reality is that today's share price, the West Musgrave project is not priced in. As I mentioned earlier, today's share price is at a level that's below the estimated net asset value of our producing portfolio. And therefore, there is you know, the uncertainty around when Mus Mus West Musgrave would come into production is uh, investors would pay zero for that risk at today's share price. Indeed. So, so I mean, just from a strategic point of view, maybe you had the chance to listen into BHP when they spoke about this, but if they pay 300 million US per year to maintain the, this complex of assets, it kind of rings a bell to me that they might be looking to, to sell them to someone else who's actually willing to pick this up and develop it. Do you think that's a likely outcome? Obviously, you have a lasting royalty that transfers to through time and, and also to other owners. So that's the beauty of the model. But maybe you could give some comments on that. Do you think it's likely? Yeah. Look, like it's difficult to speculate as to what's likely. I think it's certainly possible, right? Because there are a range of possible outcomes. The first would be that BHP um, restarts the operation in time. You look, there's, if you look at the, you know, when folks forecast the expected cost of producing um, a lot of the nickel supply, particularly in Indonesia, just by virtue of grade depletion, there's an expectation that the cost of those operations will move up you know, between now and the end of the decade. And therefore that would, that shift in the cost curve could mean that uh, the, uh, these assets are much more competitively positioned um, relative to other assets producing nickel. And in that scenario, you'd probably expect PHP to keep the operations and turn them on in the future. Uh, and some of the disclosures from BHP would imply that that's perhaps uh, the current base case. BHP has said effectively they anticipate the nickel market to tighten and uh, towards, you know, in the next couple of years, uh, they continue to believe in the long-term attractive fundamentals for the nickel market. Uh, that's one scenario. Um, another in the future could simply be that, you know, BHP, as you mentioned, sells the division or pieces of the division and in that context, the West Musgrave asset is really a great asset as a standalone operation, of course, right? It was originally, prior to um, BHP acquiring Oz Minerals, contemplated to be a standalone mine. And in that context, it was, you know, could easily be reconfigured back to where it was originally expected to be, uh, uh, just a standalone operation. And in the world today, there are not many fully permitted, low cost, copper nickel assets, roughly a quarter or a fifth of the way built in Australia. So in that context, we'd anticipate that there would be many uh, mine miners or mine developers interested in this sort of asset, uh, but time will tell. But in any event, it does give us confidence that one way or another, uh, this asset is very likely to come into production in time. Right. And did, B, did BHP kind of indicate what kind of uh, nickel prices they would like to see for what period of time? And did, did they leave any comments on that to kind of say that they would restart at, the, at that point? Or it's just a vague situation in that regard, public facing it? At this point, anyways, from what we've seen in the BHP disclosure, it's sort of a wait and see. Um, and that really informs a little bit the, that, 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 that logic can be seen in the intent to revisit um, the, nickel, the, the, the nickel division, uh, a restart um, by February 2027. So um, part of it, I think, will be a function of how the market develops, 
uh, and um, you know we'll, we'll have to see. But I suppose you know one thing that's really important to keep in mind is you know West Musgrave as an asset is one that's not entirely connected. Its future is not entirely connected and doesn't really need a sharp rebound in the nickel price still to be generating strong cash flows. So um, you just have to, you know, it's important to think about West Musgrave as, first of all, a standalone operation, but also a standalone operation that's really important to the future of the Nickel West division by virtue of a source of feed for the Nickel West, smel nickel, nickel West smelter and refinery. So I guess that kind of covers the main developments, at least that you guys have, have highlighted, but maybe you can comment on the broader portfolio. Is there anything else worthwhile speaking about in the broader portfolio since last we spoke, you know, three, four months ago, you would like to highlight? Yeah. Well, look, I think we've spent a lot of time talking about the um, inflection point over at Boise's Bay. And I think that broadly applies if one takes a view on 2024 to 2026 for our portfolio. And, you know, we have a lot more work to do, Gorm, in terms of further diversifying this business. And if one looks at the 24 to 2030 period, what we have now built into the portfolio is a bit of a treadmill of opportunities that are increasingly moving forward towards development and first production. Um, that You can see that in our copper pipeline that we've discussed. Uh, and just one point to note is uh, continued progress at the uh, Nifty project, which is owned by Cyprium in Australia. This is a brownfield restart. Uh, Cyprium has recently disclosed that they raised uh, $40 million Australian and they're looking to complete a financing for an additional roughly uh, Aussie $20 million, which should be sufficient to, well, Aussie's $30 million, $20 million should be sufficient to restart um, heat leaching activities, which could create cash flow. And in the intervening period, um, further study and bring forward the restart of a concentrator with a target of a 17 year mine life and 36,000 tons of contained copper per year production, um, which, which is really positive. Um, it's very low cost. It's brownfield in Australia. There's a lot to like about this asset. And secondly, when we acquired the royalty, uh, the, the concentrator uh, open pit operation was expected to be producing something like 20, was, was, the group at the time was targeting production of 25,000 tons of copper per year. So we've seen since we bought the royalty, uh, a target of a 50% almost increase in copper production annually over a 17 year life, which is really good news. And I think, you know, that's just indicative of, as I mentioned, the treadful, treadmill of development assets that are expected to, you know, move forward and in time contribute to our royalty portfolio over the next six years and beyond. Um, and we feel that, I think you'll probably get to this point, but since we're on the topic, you know, we feel more generally when we think about our business development strategy and how we can improve in Quora, uh, strategically, we think at this time, the best thing we can do is to further diversify our rev sources of revenue in the period of 2024 to 2030 in particular, to provide further comfort on growth and income stability as Kestrel tapers off over the next six years. Um, and we'll be looking to do that in particular in base metals uh, with copper, with a, with a strategic objective of maintaining copper at the core of our commodity exposure. And with Nifty, just to clarify there, so so what's the royalty terms for you guys? You said 36,000 tons of copper per annum, so people can mm -hmm. kind of extrapolate what that would mean for you guys. Yeah, well, when we bought the royalty, the guidance at the time was somewhere in the range of one to three, I believe, per annum. Um, that's of course increasing as a result of the um, of the um, concentrator throughput. But again, the guidance we gave at the time when we bought the royalty assumed a certain timeline in terms of the ramp up of the oxide and then the sulfide. So, in, once the company releases an updated um, technical study in relation to the restart of the concentrator. We'll look to refresh guidance on what that means for Ecora in terms of re revenue contribution over the life of, of the project. And what is that expected for approximately? Later this year. Okay. Uh, and when, yeah. when, with the current information, this is for obviously a, 
kind of a, a, an uncertain thing. But when, when would you expect this to be into sort of ramp up to, to get into the 36 or 37,000 tons per annum production profile? You had a heat bleach first and then concentrate or so. Is that yeah, three years I'll, away I'll from or what's your sense? I think we'll just have to see what's in the technical report. I think as a royalty company, you know, at the end of the day, we are not developing the operations our partners are. And therefore, um, rather than speculate today, given it's only you know months away, it's probably just wait, worth waiting to seeing what's coming from um, the operator. Uh, I, I think it's important to keep in mind, though, just as a high level point that the concentrator already exists, right? So this yeah. is a brownfield operation. So there's not they don't need to build a new concentrator. They don't need to fund the construction of a new concentrator, although they may look to upgrade the existing infrastructure and facilities. It's uh, from a project perspective, you know, between it's, it's a brownfield expansion. And I think that's really important when one thinks to your question in terms of timeline execution risk, it's just on a relative basis, less likely to see uh, the type of capital costs and time overruns and delays that might be the case from a risk profile in a greenfield operation. Mm. Yeah, but, but it, it kind of sounds like it will be a three to five million US royalty contribution once in production full scale, which is very, which is a good, a good, a, a good nice addition to the copper side of things, right? So that, that's, that's very yeah. good here. I mean, in itself, you know, Nifty doesn't change Ecora. But I think what does change Ecora is the combination of royalties like Nifty in our business. So in other words, a diversified source of income across multiple operators, commodities, and so forth, which taken as a package incrementally one to another uh, really changes the complexion of this business. And if one takes a te- like over the next 10 years, for example, you know, Nifty is just one amongst many other projects that's moving forward towards first production with, you know, if you think of our copper pipeline, Today, uh, we have Manto Blancos in production. That asset has the potential to do more, uh, both from you know, existing, uh, the existing circuit, but also the potential to uh, further improve throughput capacity. Uh, so next off the rank, so to speak, is either Nifty or Capstone's Santo Domingo. You know, thereafter, you have Biscachitas. There's West Musgrave, of course, with a very big copper element. And then beyond that, there's a Canary Echo. So the more that we can just add to that growth profile, I think then Okora, the topic and the narrative very rapidly changes from being what's happening over at Kestrel, but actually the growth profile of organic growth that sits in this royalty portfolio today that really doesn't get a lot of attention. And with the, the first step, I think personally, is the continued ramp up of Boise's Bay. Because so I do believe that'll really change the, how this equity is perceived uh, as being a high growth company, X coal, as opposed to a business with assets that are um, with with assets, but as a starting point being a coal focus. Yes. And, and I think if we speak to the kind of the general market outlook and so on, I mean, you've mentioned now the mandate, of course, it's, it's a logical mandate. You need to replace income and so on. But I think that's quite clear. That's going to happen with the existing portfolio. So you're, you're going to build uh, upon that. And I think it's reassuring also that you have not made any crazy kind of portfolio acquisitions where you may, might acquire 10 things at once just to, to get there uh, that might have been very diluted. You've taken it kind of step by step and done it with, kind of w- w- with a method in mind and remain prudent, which I, I really like. And I expect you to continue to, to do that. Uh, and I think many other royalty companies with the pressure that you have uh, kind of... Uh, over the years now changing the entire business would have made that mistake. So uh, that's very good. Um, but if you just comment on what, what do you see out in the market right now? And what do you think is the likelihood of, of you guys allocating more capital? You speak generally to it. What kind of opportunities you see the, the set of opportunities mm-hmm. as of now, the next 12 months, let's say. Yeah, well, first and foremost, I think in terms of the opportunity set itself, we've seen a big pickup in just the opportunities in 2024 relative to 2023, particularly amongst assets that are either, you know, much closer to production. And frankly, that's always a function of market conditions because the opportunity set and the nature of the opportunities that we review, um, I would say, you know, evolves and changes to reflect wider equity capital market conditions or commodity commodity cycles. And today, 
I think we see a lot more opportunities that are much closer in terms of production. So either brownfield or green stage construction or um, uh, producing royalty opportunities, you know, operations that are kind of already running. Um, when these uh, opportunities close, it's always really hard to predict, which I think is, you know, difficult for the investors in a royalty company. But, but similarly is the case for every royalty company investor across the royalty sector, simply because royalties are not usually the only uh, financing source. Often a royalty transaction will happen in parallel, perhaps to an equity solution or a debt solution, potentially in connection with M&A, in connection with a development decision, uh, or in connection with a decision to you know, launch a study on a project. So, uh, while the opportunities are there, the exact timing can be as short as you know a month or two, two years, right? Um, and I think, in my opinion, the key really is just to be patient, right? I think we've we have a good sense of what opportunities we think would be really attractive um, additions to our portfolio. Of course, we'd be opportunistic if something came along, and and it met our investment criteria. Uh, but in the absence of seeing things that meet our investment criteria and deliver on our strategic objectives of you know, adding high quality assets to our business, and in particular, adding assets that'll contribute to income between 24 and 2030, uh, 2030 being at the later end. We're very happy just to pay back our debt levels. So today the business operates at 1.4 times net debt to EBITDA leverage ratio, which is well, well below our financial covenants. And in the absence of doing a deal, we think that you know keeping our powder dry, so to speak, and just being patient, especially in the is the right thing to do. And that's especially in the context of you know where markets now are now. Um, I think when we last spoke, we had a view that you know the opportunity there was a bit of a window, cyclically speaking, to to buy good quality assets before the commodity price cycle really accelerated. And I think that's likely to be a little bit longer than today from looking where, you know, macro conditions are in the world uh, versus even six months ago. So if we don't do a deal immediately and we pay down debt, we think that actually is as much of a positive of adding royalties in the intervening period for investors when they look at our stock today. Uh, by no means do we feel like our balance sheet is stretched or unmanageable or uncomfortable. But, you know, I think that you know, being in a position to strike when we see something we really like is is crucial. So what you're saying is that you feel like, as you said last time, you have a window, but you feel like the window has been extended and maybe accentuated potentially, and that might be even further so in the coming 12 months, i.e. Yeah. what you're saying is capital will be more scarce, most likely, in the sector, is, is your feeling. Well, you could take copper as an example, right? When we went into... We finished 2023 with global copper inventories at historically really low levels. And a lot of folks are pointing to that as an expectation that by the end of 2024, copper prices would be much, much higher uh, than spot at the time. And you know, there are some folks even forecasting in the short term or relatively short term copper prices at $15,000 per ton. Um, and as 2024 has played out, what we've seen is uh, copper inventories actually have built back up. So the expectation on copper prices in the next year or two has softened. Um, and that helps us actually, right? Because developers who were kind of in wait and see mode and thought, well, if copper prices do run to those levels, I don't need any financing, are now uh, having that expectation pushed back to, are probably a bit more open to one of our financing solutions, just by virtue of uh, getting an external source rather than reinvesting internal cash flows. And number two, I think it means that um, there's just an expect, there's no expectation that, you know, when we look to price these royalties, you know, on the, on, on the, on the mining company side that, you know, if copper could be at $15,000, there's a bit of a nervousness to do a royalty deal with us Right, and obviously we don't price in those sorts of levels uh, on, on, in the short term. So I think, the, in other words, to put it differently, the bid ask spread between where we see copper prices and where miners copper see copper prices has really is closer to convergence, which is always a great time to be in when you're looking to to do do royalty acquisitions. Yes, yes, very much so.
Uh, and just to clarify for people, what uh, what does the dry powder actually look like right now? Like w- how much capital could you deploy without being sort of overstretched? You're not currently, but what's the quantum that you would feel yeah. sensible? Look, I think I think we're very comfortable. If we had a very clear deleveraging plan and we we're deploying into a royalty that was either in production or very close to, you know, two and a half times a bit uh, with a clear and rapid deleveraging plan is very comfortable in our opinion. And that's always a function, of course, so as a starting point of what are wider market conditions like and what's the outlook, right? So if the outlook is very poor and the possibility of a downside case is relatively higher, then of course that'll factor into where we might be comfortable on the leverage side. Yeah. But just assuming that the outlook doesn't have any sort of cliffs, so to speak, or isn't... Um, isn't suggesting that you know, one should be ultra conservative and prudent in terms of taking on leverage. That's where we feel is a comfortable place to be on the leverage profile. In theory, the business, our facility allows us to go up to four times to, on an acquisition, um, but that's obviously on the higher end of things. So I think you know, ultimately, and I made the point to you when we last spoke, um, royalty companies, by their very definition, offer investors with relatively de-risk exposure to commodity exposure, to commodities, excuse me. And if one you know, overlays a royalty company with too much financial leverage, not necessarily at the time of close, but financial leverage that doesn't have a clear path to reduction, we feel that that can erode one of the highlights of our business model and one of the attractions of our business model. So we're very very, very careful to, as part of our capital allocation priorities, you know, balance growth, which is core, but also maintaining balance sheet strength, which is also core. And any investment decision is taken in the context of both. Yeah, I mean, if we look at Sandstorm, for example, which is a company that I like a lot, that we like a lot, uh, they did this uh, and they were they are rapidly paying back the debt, but nevertheless, they, they got quite punished by taking on the debt in the first place and it's still kind of sticking around. So I think it's, it's certainly something one has to be very mindful of as a royalty model. Yeah, but then I, I know people might have diverging opinions on, on uh, the, the package acquisitions there, but uh, yeah, nevertheless, I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a important point to, to focus in on. But when you say four times or 2.5 times, you know, cash flow uh, can vary in terms of it cash flow. So the EBITDA figure can vary quite a bit depending on, on circumstances. So, if we just speak in a range of absolute quantums of capitals, capital deployed that you could see uh, for a core, could, could you give a range? Is it like 30 to 100 or or what would be your sense of, of capital that you could potentially deploy? Of course, well, it depends look, on the cash flow profile, depending on the asset you acquire. or, or Exactly. So it depends on, you know, the starting point, of course, is are you buying a producing royalty? Yeah. Because if you're buying a producing royalty, that's incremental to your debt capacity, right? Of course. So... I guess to answer the question today, it's probably I think you're more asking on what can the business do on the existing portfolio as opposed to you know ignoring, of course, what the impact is of what we might buy. Is that fair, Gorm? Yes, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. So in that context, you know, again today at this exact second, uh, based on the um, the recent um, like if you if you were to just look at our EBITDA as of 30 June on an LTM basis, it's going up to another one times would add somewhere in the range of 40 to 50 million, right? So go from we're at 1.4 to go to 2.5, that would be 40 to 50 million, or maybe we'll 40 to 60 probably. But then in that context, uh, if you look at this business over the next 12 to 24 months, absent any further acquisitions, is a very rapid deleveraging uh, that's expected to occur just by virtue of our um, organic cash flows. So you know you could be in yeah. the range by the end of next year at fifty to sixty million dollars in that debt. Again, it assumes on commodity prices, of course, and then by the end of the twenty twenty six, much lower in absolute terms. So you know there's the the, the firepower actually is is going to grow, right? All else being equal, over the next twenty four months. Um, so it sounds like if things are, I mean. Uh, on a current portfolio basis, let's say 40, 50, if you push that up, let's say if you do a hundred million or 80 to a hundred million dollar deal for a big producing asset, that would mean that you have a delta of 40 to 50 uh, more 
that has to be leveraged on the produce or on the EBITDA generated by that royalty. So it sounds like that would be the kind of maxed out range, range to do because you. Yeah, but then there are other things. It's never it's never cut and dry, right? Because of course, then you can always look at staged payments, and we've done that in the past, right? When we bought the SAT thirty two royalty portfolio, if you remember, there's upwards of fifty million dollars that was in staged payments. And of course, the logic there was that we would reduce the drawn debt and then fund part of the acquisition by virtue of um, just the organic cash flows. In other words, keep the leverage profile down. So there are other things that you can do that will allow you to do bigger transactions, ignoring equity issuance, uh, but with, 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 but that aren't necessarily all um, tied to um, you know, immediate debt impact on day one. So, yeah. you know, look, I think I'm not, I'm certainly not trying to be evasive, but I think it's a function of the fact that this group has just been very creative in the past, right? And when you look at the deals that we've done before, we've done it in such a way with a goal of keeping the leveraged numbers down that actually we've done deals that if you just look at our debt capacity at the time, um, would not on paper have been representative of the possible. So I think the starting point in this analysis today at this second would be yeah, 40 to 60 if you go from one and a half roughly to um, two and a half kind of in that range plus or minus. And then of course, there's other things that you can do just creatively to upsize the transaction value, but not have an immediate impact on your leverage ratios. Um, and, and all in that context, that's really driven from a desire that, you know, from where we sit today, the balance sheet is, um, we're very confident comfortable with where the balance sheet is. This business is not overly levered. It's not distressed in terms of its debt profile, but bizarrely, uh, not because of the debt levels, but for other factors, if one is just looking at the stock price relative to net asset value, one could erroneously conclude, in my opinion, that the business is distressed. Yes, and obviously equity is not even a consideration for you guys. I mean, what we should probably discuss uh, your your willingness to allocate to buying back the existing portfolio, right? So is that something you're planning to do further? I know you concluded a program in May, I believe. And uh, are you planning on buying back more stock? Is that part of the equation or are you preferring growth at this point? Yeah, so earlier this year, we completed a $10 million buyback program. And if you look at the history of this company, any buyback program has been um, funded by selling uh, listed equities. So most recently we sold uh, a stake in a royalty company called Labrador Iron Ore Royalty Corp. Mm. And that was much closer to one times NAV to buy back stock in Ecora, which was trading, you know, I don't know, at the time, I don't remember the exact figure, but plus or minus 0.5 NAV based on broker estimates. So really a tr a, it was effectively a, a creative reallocation of capital. And important to note though, it didn't result in incremental debt. Right. So in other words, we didn't incrementally draw down in our debt facility to fund the buyback. Buybacks are part of our capital allocation framework. And this was discussed at the time of our last board meeting alongside our capital allocation discussion more generally. And at this time, we feel that um, we can unlock share, more shareholder value, relatively speaking, by acquiring royalties that will contribute to income profile in the short term and medium term, of course. Uh, uh, rather than uh, incrementally um, uh, launching a buyback program. So it's not to say that in the future we, we wouldn't consider buyback programs, but having just completed a program for the immediate future, uh, we'll be looking to uh, deploy capital to either acquiring royalties that are very advanced stage uh, of, 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 uh, in their development, if not producing very close to, or simply paying back debt uh, and keeping that firepower available should the opportunity arise. Excellent, Mark. I think that's a good place to, to kind of wrap up on. It's good that you're clear in, with your capital allocation strategy. So we'll, we'll wish you the best of luck. And I think we'll be back for another kind of asset overview update in, in X amount of months here, hopefully before end of year or, or next year. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Well, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to go through this with you. I look forward to our next catch up.